Okay, well, I, I like to measure things, uh, and I started measuring some GPSs. And uh, the, the first presentation uh, that I'm doing is, is going to talk about the performance of some modern GPS modules. And then that sort of segues into the Tangerine SDR, uh, where I'll talk for just a couple of minutes about the clock design. Uh, with the, the uh, choice of GPS module ties directly into what we're doing for the clock module. And uh, one thing that we might want to hear about more later is, you know, someone posted a very inexpensive, a link to a very inexpensive GPS module earlier on one of the chat windows. I can't find it. And, and you know, puts out pulse per second and things. And a, a good question to answer is, might be, why, why do we need these fancy GPSs that are more expensive than something that's super cheap? And are there any ways to make these quality measurements less expensive? But maybe we can answer that after your... Yeah, that, it's a great question. And hopefully the presentation might answer part of it, but we can talk about it afterwards. That sounds great. Hi, I'm John Ackerman, NAUR. And this morning I'm going to talk about the results of some measurements that I recently did on a number of U-Blocks GNSS or GPS receiver modules. This is work that's related to the uh, clock module design of the Tangerine SDR. GPS systems have been used for precision frequency and timing for a long time. And board level uh, inexpensive GPS modules have offered a pulse per second output for many years. And even the old receivers uh, got what's really remarkable accuracy if you think about it. Uh, you can get a time signal out of those receivers that's within a, 100 nanoseconds of the official US Naval Observatory time. Just amazing. Uh, and with some effort, you can get closer to 10 nanoseconds. Now, a time pulse like that can be used for a number of things. You can set a clock with it. You can use it to timestamp uh, data that you're logging. And you can use it as the reference for a GPS disciplined oscillator. Uh, basically, you adjust your local frequency standard to track uh, the pulse per second, and now you can reproduce the frequency uh, accuracy and stability of the GPS constellation. Uh, that's what I was interested in, and I'll talk more about it in my other presentation. Uh, but in using it for that purpose, there's a, a problem because the pulse per second output from the GPS, although it's very accurate in the long run, is kind of noisy in the short term. There's a second to second jitter uh, that can be 50 nanoseconds or so in an older unit, less than 10 in a, in a modern one. Uh, and those are very small numbers, but they're enough to complicate the design of the GPS DO. So I wanted to see whether more modern receivers might be able to offer lower noise and thus allow us to do some different things in our GPS DO design. So why did I think that there might be an improvement? Well, the new devices are just incrementally better. Uh, they have faster clocks, faster processors, some software capabilities that are important. But uh, perhaps most important, uh, we now have, uh, for the first time, affordable dual frequency GPS receivers. What does that mean? Uh, a traditional consumer GPS uh, listened to a single carrier frequency at 1575 megahertz, called L1, and it decoded a single digital code that's modulated on that frequency called the CA code that runs at about one megahertz. Uh, by synchronizing to that code, the GPS could establish uh, the timing and distance from the satellite and then the navigation position. But the satellites also broadcast a second carrier called L2 that's at 1227 megahertz and uh, modulation codes that run at a faster rate, which means that they have better resolution and you can get a more precise uh, timing. Uh, a dual frequency receiver has a huge advantage. One of the uh, main error components of GPS fixes is the uh, delay of the signal passing from the satellite through the ionosphere. That delay varies with time and location, uh, and it's one of the single biggest sources of error in a GPS fix. It turns out that if you have the same signal modulated under carriers a couple of hundred megahertz apart, like L1 and L2, you can work out that delay and compensate for it. So a dual frequency receiver is able to take out uh, the ionospheric delay, and that produces much better accuracy in its results. 
that's really a, a great advantage. The problem is that until very recently, a dual frequency receiver uh, was a commercial survey or a geodetic scientific unit, and the starting price was in the ten dollars to $20,000 range, completely out of reach for hams. But uh, in the last two years, Ublox has introduced a couple of new units that are ZED F9 series. Uh, that are dual frequency receivers for less than $200. And that was really exciting and I wanted to see uh, how they worked. So it was time to do some tests. And thanks to the HAMSAI Consortium, and I, I do want to acknowledge uh, the support uh, from the NSF grants that are shown on this slide, uh, I was able to get my hands on several of the current U-Blocks receivers. They're shown in this table. In this short uh, presentation, I don't have time, unfortunately, to go into details about all the receivers or all the tests that I performed, uh, but I have a paper in the proceedings that has more than you would ever want to know about GPS performance, and I encourage you to look at it if you're interested in this sort of thing. It might fascinate you or it might put you to sleep or it might even do both at the same time, uh, but it will have a lot more detail than I'm able to provide now uh, in this presentation. I'm just going to have to skim over some of the really uh, high points. Uh, so the test plan was to compare the PPS outputs, uh, which Ublox calls time pulse outputs, from all of the receivers against the local atomic clock uh, that had a known stability and accuracy. I wanted to measure all the receivers simultaneously using the same antenna to allow direct comparison. I wanted to measure for several days to get long-term data, and I wanted to do additional runs targeting some specific capabilities and options that some of the receivers have. The first problem was how do I measure seven receivers at once? Uh, a few years ago, I designed something called the TIC uh, timestamp encounter, which basically is a stopwatch with 60 picosecond precision that can measure two inputs. So I took four of those, put them in a box, uh, linked them up to a common time base and synchronization and a logging system and came up with a multi-tick, uh, which was a fascinating project in itself. And I wish I had time to talk about it. Uh, if you're interested, the uh, paper that's referenced on the slide has all the details about both the hardware and the software uh, that's involved in doing that. Once the multi-tick was ready, I set up the experiment. Um, all seven receivers were set up uh, with uh, their default configuration, except that where the receiver supported 0D or timing mode, uh, that was selected. Uh, 0D uh, means that instead of having to solve for four variables, uh, latitude, longitude, height, and time, the receiver is told it's latitude, longitude, and height, and only has to solve for time. In theory, that gives a better result. Uh, for those receivers, the fixed location was set to the previously surveyed uh, position of the antenna. Uh, the receivers were all connected to that common antenna through splitters. Uh, their time pulse outputs were connected to the multi-tick. And a 10 megahertz signal from an HP 5071A cesium atomic uh, frequency standard uh, was uh, used to drive the multi-tick as the reference that the PPS signals were compared with. The uh, data output was logged to a computer, and we collected uh, PPS data for just under six days, about 510,000 samples per receiver, and then analyzed that with the most excellent uh, time lab software that John Miles, KE5FX, wrote and has made available to the community. Uh, the results uh, showed that there were two groups of receivers, basically, in terms of their timing performance. Uh, on this slide, we see both uh, a plot and a table, and uh, I want to introduce you to the Allen deviation, which is the standard statistic that's used to uh, determine the stability of a clock or an oscillator. It's a little bit like standard deviation, but tuned uh, for the purposes of, of clocks uh, and oscillators. Uh, the, t the plot shows uh, on the x-axis uh, the sampling time. We may have a pulse per second signal, but we may only want to look at it every 10 or 100 seconds. So this uh, plot shows time from one second at the left to a million seconds at the right, and the data only goes up to about 100,000 seconds, and that's a, line, a logarithmic scale. The y-axis is fractional uh, frequency difference. Um, it's a complicated word and concept, but think about it as analogous to a percentage of how much the signal wanders around in relation to the sampling interval. Uh, it, the Allen deviation tells us essentially, if we take a number of readings at the same interval, what's the likely range of the data in all of those readings? Uh, and a lower number is better. Uh, and it's a fractional frequency and in a good system, it's going to be a tiny number. So we 
use scientific notation. If you look at the uh, table, you can see that the receiver is uh, broken into the two groups, the, the line of, of good ones that's lower and the other ones that are a little bit higher on the plot. Uh, the three good ones are the LEA M8F, which is a single frequency receiver. It's fascinating. It's got some unique capabilities, but unfortunately I don't have time to talk about it. In the paper, I have several pages of discussion about what the M8F can and can't do. Uh, the other two good receivers were the dual frequency ones, as we had hoped. Uh, the F9P and the F9T are both substantially better than, than the others, and uh, that's exactly what we wanted to hear. And in fact, um, if we look at the plot on the left, uh, you can see that the blue line, which is the single frequency M8 receiver, is about a half an order of magnitude worse than the dual frequency on the Magenta line. If you look at the plot on the right, that's simply the raw data, uh, the time uh, interval that was recorded uh, with uh, the seconds on the X -axis, axis being just the length of the run and the Y axis being the absolute uh, noise uh, in, se in seconds, and the scale here is uh, nanoseconds. If you look at the blue line, uh, which is the single frequency receiver, you can see there's a lot of noise. The magenta line, the dual frequency receiver, has a lot less noise. And that's the eyeball uh, reason why the Allen deviation plot shows better results for the dual frequency receiver. Now, there are two models of the F9. The P model has an RTK engine, basically a, a differential GPS where uh, correction data can be fed in and the output could be uh, reduced down to, uh, to a uncertainty of a centimeter or two. It's really quite remarkable. The P model is what you'd want to use for surveying applications. The T model is the same basic receiver, but does not have the RTK. Instead, it does have some extra input output, and it costs a little bit less. We're looking at using the T model in the Tangerine SDR. So uh, the first question about whether the dual frequency receiver gave us better timing is answered clearly yes. It's about a half an order of magnitude better. The second question is, can we do better than that by using some of these software features that I mentioned? Uh, there's a thing called sawtooth or quantization error uh, that's in almost all GPSs. The problem is that while the GPS computer can calculate when the beginning of the second is with great precision, perhaps you know, to within a nanosecond, uh, the clock hardware is only capable of generating an output pulse based on the speed of, of that clock. If the clock were running at 10 megahertz uh, and you trigger the pulse per second output uh, off of the edge of, of the crystal clock, that means that although you may know the time to within a nanosecond, you may have to set it to the tick uh, 100 nanoseconds. Uh, uh, it could be several nanoseconds uh, uh, on either side of the actual time and that reduced uh, results in a, a sawtooth error, and you can see very clearly in the right-hand uh, plot, which again is just the raw data, uh, uh, zoomed in to show a couple of hundred seconds, uh, and we see this, this jagged sawtooth pattern as well as some other interesting uh, patterns laid on top of it, and those uh, uh, patterns and that noise interferes with the ability to get uh, low noise results. The modern receivers have the neat capability of, of knowing how uh, much the difference is between the hardware signal uh, that it can output on the PPS and the actual time. And they can provide that information in a message as part of the serial data output. In theory, we can take that message and, and, and uh, then uh, add or subtract uh, the, that error from the recorded data and remove the sawtooth. And these plots show that that actually works. Uh, again, the, the blue plot, uh, the blue line on the right-hand plot is the raw data. The magenta line is after we just mathematically remove the noise using the sawtooth uh, correction message. And we can see how the noise almost disappears. Looking at the Allen deviation plot on the left, uh, the blue line is the uncorrected data. The green line is the corrected uh, for the F9T receiver. And you can see about an order of magnitude improvement. Uh, the uh, single frequency receiver has also benefited, uh, a huge benefit at short term, but as you get out uh, to 100 seconds or so, that benefit almost goes away. That's just the, the nature of the architecture of the receiver. So using sawtooth correction definitely works, and 
sawtooth correction coupled with the dual frequency receiver means that we can start with a noise level that's about an order and a half of magnitude better than the GPS that's probably running the GPS DO that you're using today. Uh, I also mentioned earlier the, the 0D timekeeping option, and, what, and I wanted to know whether that really made a difference, and it does. If you look again at the right-hand plot, which is the raw data, the blue line is the 0D mode. This is the F9T receiver. And the magenta line is the 3D mode. And you can see how much more it wanders around. If you look at the Allen deviation plot, you see that at short uh, tower or sampling intervals, uh, there's almost no difference. But as you get out past 100 seconds, uh, the 3D results uh, become significantly worse than the 0D. So uh, the question of whether we should use 0D uh, is definitely a yes uh, for the answer. Another uh, question that's not really related to the GPSDO but has come up is that these receivers uh, actually allow you to set the time pulse to much faster rates than PPS. And in fact, you can set them to 10 megahertz or higher. And so the obvious question is, can I use that as an RF source? Why not just take that 10 megahertz directly? Well, the problem is the phase noise is horrible. Uh, the plot on the left is a phase noise uh, plot, um, and it's very noisy, uh, if you'll excuse the pun, uh, because it's showing seven receivers, all seven of the units. Um, but uh, having the lowest point on the chart at about minus 100 dBC uh, indicates that for RF purposes, uh, these are not good devices. It may be more intuitive to look at the right-hand image, which is a spectrum analyzer plot, the green trace is a good quality signal generator at 10 megahertz. The black trace is the 10 megahertz uh, time pulse output. And you can see that it has noise uh, about 30 dB higher uh, than the signal generator. So the answer here is that you really cannot use this uh, as an RF source unless you either have extremely lenient requirements or uh, a way to clean up the signal before you apply it to a receiver or a transmitter chain. Uh, it's, it's just far worse than any sort of RF synthesizer or other signal source should be. Now, I've been told that some people use GPS for things other than timing, some edge cases like knowing where you're located. So I thought it would be worthwhile to do some measurements of positioning performance as well. So uh, all seven receivers were set up with a common antenna, and I logged 12 hours of their data uh, to a, a disk file using getting just their uh, uh, position uh, ASCII data output. And then I processed the data to generate what's called a circular error of probability, CEP, and uh, you assign a percentage to it. So CEP 95%, which is the most commonly used one, that, that's the radius of a circle it contains 95% of all the plots in, in the data set of all the individual fixes. Uh, so it tells us kind of how big a circle uh, the data will fall in if we measure it for some period of time. And here we can see that uh, all of the eight series receivers have similar performance, about 2.3 to 2.9 meters. Uh, and that's about what you'd expect from a modern single frequency receiver. Uh, the M9N receiver is very interesting. It's a low-cost unit. It replaces the M8N, and the N stands for navigation model. This is the kind of receiver you'd put in a car. Um, and notice it's 1.68 uh, meters, so it's significantly better than the other single-frequency receivers. Then we get to the ZF9P, the dual frequency, and again, it's, it's significantly better still, uh, 1.49 uh, meters. Um, which, again, we would hope that with dual frequency, that's the result. The problem is the ZF9T receiver. Its uh, performance really should be about identical to that of the P, but I, here we look at it, and it's uh, among the worst of the units. So there's definitely something wrong. I don't know whether it's a hardware problem or a configuration problem or a firmware issue, but uh, the results for the F9T are, are I think, clearly uh, questionable, and we need to do some further investigation. I mentioned uh, the RTK engine that the P receivers have. I had a chance only to do one very quick test, uh, but I was able to apply the RTK correction using the uh, single frequency M8P receiver and the dual frequency F9P. And you can see the results are really amazing. Uh, the CEP 95% is now 25 millimeters, one inch for the F9P and 29 millimeters for the M8P.
Uh, so uh, that's just kind of astounding, one inch accuracy. Now, uh, I do question the MAT results because that receiver is performing far better than it should. Uh, I would expect to see something more like 40 or 50 centimeters. So again, this was a quick test. Uh, I need to go back and, and do it more carefully and more thoroughly. Uh, but the, the short answer is RTK processing certainly can provide dramatically improved positioning performance if you're able to provide that correction information. It doesn't really help you with timing though. This is purely for positioning. And finally, these receivers are able to log uh, raw satellite observations that can then be sent off for post-processing. Uh, I did some measurements uh, with uh, the single frequency receiver and both the F9P and the F9T, uh, receiving just the GPS uh, constellation and also uh, in the F9T GPS and GLONASS, and then sent them off uh, for processing by the Natural Resources of Canada uh, web tool. The URL is shown on the slide. I also tested an old commercial survey receiver that was able to do the GPS constellation only. Um, the results show about what you'd expect. Uh, the MAP receiver is in the 30, 40 centimeter range uh, with correction. Uh, all the dual frequency receivers are getting down to the less than an inch and sometimes less than 10 millimeters range. Uh, so they, they perform remarkably well. Uh, the F9P performs a little bit worse than the commercial NetRS receiver. The F9T with the GLONASS constellation enabled performs a little bit better. Uh, there are reasons for that that I don't have time to go into, but the moral of the story is to use both GPS and GLONASS uh, for measurements if you can. There may be times when that doesn't work, uh, but it, uh, it does improve uh, results uh, by having both constellations available. So I've told you about the timing performance and a little bit about the positioning performance, and now I'm happy to answer any questions that you might have. Thank you very much, John. That was wonderful. So thank you very much, John. That was wonderful. Oh, thank you. Um, okay, I see a question about GPS plus GLONASS for uh, only one location. Things are zooming quickly by here. For um, or or only for location or also for timing. Uh, good, it's a really good question. Uh, for timing purposes, you really want to use only one uh, constellation because the GPS constellation is being driven by the U.S. Naval's naval observatory clocks while the GLONASS is being driven by the Russian equivalent and although they're both extremely accurate they are slightly different so uh, timing purposes uh, you really want just a single constellation but for positioning uh, uh, additional satellites basically gives you better results um, I see how do you correct the quantization error for a GPS DL? Uh, well, what we're going to do, and I'll talk about this briefly in, in the next uh, presentation, uh, the uh, processor for the GPS DL will take the input of the time difference between the local pulse per second and the GPS pulse per second, and it will also read the data of, on, this, on the GPS serial port that tells us, hey, the next pulse is gonna be four nanoseconds early. And it will sim it'll simply make that compensation in software. So uh, we take the hardware message and apply the software correction to it uh, in the uh, FPGA processor uh, that will be uh, running the control loop. Um, John, there was a question on uh, using Trimble receivers. He wants to know your opinion on uh, the quality, I guess, of those, or whether you're just paying for the name. Mm. Well, there, the problem is there's a whole wide range of Trimble receivers. They make some fairly inexpensive ones on up to the $20,000 surveying receivers. Uh, but they're, they're one of the two main uh, receivers used in the surveying and geodetics world. Uh, uh, Leica seems to be the other really big brand. Uh, for timing, actually, there's a couple of other um, companies, uh, Septentrio. Uh, and I think there's another one called uh, Polaris. 
uh, that make specialized units that some of the timing labs use. But again, those are multi-thousand dollar devices. So um, I'm focusing on the, the stuff that's potentially within our, our price range. Uh, but even the used uh, surveying receivers, you know, uh, can be quite expensive. Uh, the oldest ones you can get for a few hundred dollars on eBay sometimes, but uh, you just uh, never know if those are going to work or not. Uh, oh, the, oh, sorry. Are you reading the questions, Sean? Well, I, yeah, I'm, I'm seeing them here. Uh, and I, I'm sort of keeping up. Uh, Richard asked, if for the F9PT, did you pull the PPS straight off the dev boards or discipline an oscillator? Uh, all the PPS measurements were raw pulse per second uh, uh, from the time pulse output of the receiver. Uh, no, no GPS DO was involved in, in those measurements. Uh, what kind of antenna do you need for the two frequencies? Uh, you do need a dual frequency antenna, and those have been uh, a little bit difficult to come by. Uh, again, the, you can buy the uh, surveying ones, but even surplus, those are a few hundred dollars. Uh, you can buy one or two hockey puck magnetic mount type uh, for less than $100, but there aren't really many uh, choices. And we've talked about uh, whether a, a ham site project might be to try to do a dual frequency antenna, um, which has some interesting complications uh, in terms of, of uh, calibration and, and characterization. But uh, that's something we're thinking about for uh, uh, after we get the first set of projects done. So also, did you see the previous question uh, did adding uh, GLONASS, does that really help you with uh, timing or is it just for position? I think I, I caught that one at the very beginning. It's it's timing only. Okay. Um, for, for, I'm sorry, I said that backwards. It's positioning only. Uh, for timing, you have the problem with two different time bases because the satellite, two satellite constellations are run by different organizations, so their clocks don't quite uh, track each other. And then how long before you reach the limitations of the clocks on the satellite? Um, that's a, a really good question. And one of the things that I haven't had time to test for the really long term yet, but with the, with the dual frequency receivers, but typically we thought that uh, if you average for 24 hours or so in a GPS DO, you can get down to an accuracy of about one part in 10 to the 12th. And that's kind of the noise floor. The, the work that I've done recently indicates you might be able to do better than that uh, with the dual frequency receivers. So uh, we may be able to get down to maybe seven or eight parts in 10 to the uh, 13th uh, with a long 24 hour kind of uh, measurement period with those receivers. And they're having a question on SBAS corrections and low cost receivers. Um, yeah, that's something I didn't play with very much. Uh, but a lot of the new receivers and most of the ones that I, that I talked about uh, uh, have the ability to receive this. SBAS is an a, a augmentation system where correction data is actually broadcast by satellites in the same frequency range as the GPS signal. And uh, you can uh, receive that data and, and get correction. Um, and a lot of the modern receivers support that. It's typically specified to only be good to about a one meter uh, or so um, uh, CEP. So it's, it's better than standalone. It's not dramatically better. The main reason it exists is to get down below the threshold that the Federal Aviation Administration requires for a GPS assisted landing. Uh, so it, it does that, but not much more. Um, I don't think it's going to be useful for timing applications. Uh, although that is something that I should probably check. How about a source for the F9T receivers? Uh, good, good question. Um, at the last time I looked, um, only Ublox makes an evaluation board for the F9T, and that board really, really sucks. Uh, it has almost no user-friendly components on it. Uh, and uh, uh, I think that's because there just isn't that much demand for the timing version. Uh, SparkFun makes a very nice board for the F9P receiver. Uh, I think it's $219. Uh, 
Um, that's great for the P, but for the T right now, there really uh, uh, isn't anybody that I know of that's got a, a nice uh, evaluation board. You can get the one from Ublox, but it's just it's, it's, a, it's a pain to work with. Okay, and I don't think you've quite answered this one. Uh, can you use GPS for the reference time and both GLONASS and GPS for intervals? Mm, I'm not quite sure I understand the intervals. Um, but see, the, the, the problem is just that the GLONASS is, is running on its own clock that's separate from GPS. And I think that there is some capability in some of the receivers to tell you what the difference between the two is. So you can kind of converge the two systems, but you still introduce an uncertainty about what's really in control at that point. So kind of everything that I've seen and heard is that for timing, you want to stick to one constellation. You might decide to use just GLONASS uh, because it's, its quality and performance is gonna be fine, uh, but it's mixing is where you start to introduce uncertainties. I, I don't know if that really answered the question or not. And the last question is, uh, the uh, are you using Lady Heather for zero D, Sawtooth, et cetera, corrections or U-Block software or something different? Um, for most of the tests that I did uh, for the pre presentation, I uh, used uh, custom software uh, running, basically written in Python for Linux. And there are a couple of uh, libraries that have been published to help communicate with the receivers to configure them. But basically I tried to get the configuration set and then I just recorded raw data uh, to file and then uh, a process that where I needed to or for the pulse per second, I just, you know, once the receiver was configured, I was just perceiving the time pulse and I didn't need to talk to the receiver any further. Okay, I think we're out of time, so take it away, George. Okay. Thanks, John. It was great. Thank you.